Hello and welcome back to the channel and we're continuing our complete Godot beginner Minecraft series. Today we'll do an introduction to Godot UI elements by making an animated main menu like this. I'll talk about signals and how they can be useful to communicate between different nodes as well as walk you through setting up an orbit camera for our animation. If you haven't seen the first video in the series you can find that in the description so let's dive right into this. So we're gonna start off with the main menu and we we could make something like this in two seconds, but we can make something way better in like three seconds. So we're going to use the level that we made as free visuals. In the file explorer, we want to duplicate the main level, name it main menu, and then open it up in the editor. We are not going to need the player character for the menu, so get rid of him and instead add a camera 3D. Drag the camera out to where we want to see the level from, and I don't know if you can actually see this with the tiny camera line but it's not facing towards the island. So in the camera transform settings, I will change the Y rotation to 90 and X rotation to negative 15, so it's tilted down. We can tick the preview checkbox in the top left to check what our menu camera will see and reposition it until we are satisfied with the result. And now that we got our visuals down, we are ready to add our first UI element. We are going to add a vertical box container as a child of the world node. This will automatically take us to the 2D view where we can position our UI elements on the screen. A VBox container is not something that we can see on screen on its own, but what it does is it arranges all of its children in one column and keeps their horizontal sizes all the same. Let's add a button node as its first child, and to change the label on the button, we type in its text property and the inspector. After that, let's duplicate this button a couple times by pressing Ctrl D, and then rename the button nodes to New Game Button, Load Button, and quit button. We're going to change the text on the other two buttons as well and after that we can select the VBox container to resize all three. Then select the buttons themselves by first clicking on the top one and then shift clicking on the bottom one. In the control settings we'll go down to the theme override section to change the font size of the buttons. Then we can wonder for a second why we resize the container before changing the font and then resize the container again. Let's zoom out to see the whole game screen, denoted by this colorful rectangle, and reposition the menu to be in the center of it. So unlike regular game elements, which have absolute positions in the form of X, Y, and Z coordinates, the best practice for UI elements is to anchor them to a location, like the middle of the screen or the bottom of the screen, because that accounts for different screen sizes. Since with a 1080p resolution, the absolute position of the center of the screen is one set of coordinates, and with a 4K resolution that's a completely different set of coordinates, the anchor system lets us avoid the headache of having different UI settings for different screen sizes. To use it, select the UI element that you want to anchor, which in our case is the VBox container, and click on this dropdown. This allows us to select the type of anchor preset we want to use for this element, ranging from being tied to screen corners, sides, or even filling an entire portion of the screen. So now now that we have a basic layout for our menu, let's attach a script to the VBox container and add functionality to the buttons. You might be wondering why we're attaching a script to the parent when the buttons are the ones that are supposed to do things. We're doing this as a way to organize all of the code for the menu and we'll use what are called signals from the buttons to communicate when things are supposed to happen. So let's select our new game button here and under the node tab and the inspector, we can see all of the signals that are available to the button node. There's signals that all UI nodes have access to. There's signals that only buttons have access to. We use these when we want to have event-driven code in our game. When something that is tracked by these signals happens, for example, a button is pressed, the signal automatically runs a function inside of a script that it is attached to. Double click on the button press signal, which allows us to select the node with a script to connect the signal to. Clicking connect here will automatically create a function which is run whenever the signal on this particular button is triggered. When the new game button is pressed, we want to run our main level, so let's load it in the script by control dragging our world file into it, 
creating a constant with the loaded level. Now to switch to our main level and the button pressed function, we'll first get the scene tree which is responsible for managing all of the nodes and scenes in our game with the get tree function and then call the change scene to packed function and pass our loaded level constant to that. This will take care of the new game button. Now let's work on the quit button by first connecting its press signal to the same script and in the function that is triggered on that signal, we again want to get the scene tree and then simply call quit. So now to test this menu, we're going to press the run current scene button because we haven't switched our main scene yet in the project settings. So this is how the main menu looks for now with the view from the camera that we set up and the three buttons. When we press new game, it properly takes us to the level. So now we can talk about juicing up the menu a little bit. Like you saw before, the way that I want to do it is by having the camera rotate around the island. We're going to do that by creating a node 3D parent for the camera, which will act as its pivot. You'll see what I mean in a second, but for now, drag the camera under the node that we just created. Since when a parent rotates, all of its children rotate around the parent as well, we can use this setup to rotate the camera around this circle out here. So watch what happens when we change the pivots Y rotation. The camera goes around the island, which is going to be a pretty cool effect, we just need a way to do this programmatically. That's gonna boil down to incrementing the Y rotation of the pivot every frame. So we're going to attach a script to the world node. In the code, we can get rid of the ready function and control drag the pivot into the code to create a variable for it. Since the process function is the one that runs every frame, we're going to write the code here and set the Y rotation degrees of the pivot to its value plus delta, which is how much time has passed since last frame, times rotation speed. And this rotation speed is just going to be a variable that we define up top and set it to eight. So this code and the process function is going to result in eight degrees of rotation every second. Starting up the scene, it looks way nicer already, but there's a slight problem with our water, looking like it had a little too much coffee. My boy is jittery. The problem here is that our water mesh is just too big. Non-beginner friendly info dump incoming, so cover your ears, but because it's size is 5000 by 5000 and its vertex positions are stored in floats, we end up trading off precision in those positions for the distances that we are covering. Because the floats that we're using can only have about 7 digits, whether they're decimal or whole number digits, decreasing the size of the mesh or splitting it up into smaller meshes for rendering purposes, wink wink, will help. That's enough of that for my beginner friendly tutorial video, click on the mesh, which we should probably have renamed by now. Go into the mesh resource here and we're looking for the subdivide width and height settings, which will help us slice up the mesh 10 times along its width and height. So that will fix the jitter. And the final thing that we can do here is change the main scene to our menu so we can just hit run every time by going into the project settings, go into the run section, and click on this file icon to select the new main scene. So now starting up the game, the jitter is gone and the menu works as intended. As always, you can get all of the source files for the project from my Patreon. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.